Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third session of the 2020 James D. Strauss Worldview Lectureship. Uh, by way of introduction again, our speaker is Dr. Dennis Edwards from North Park Theological Seminary in Chicago. And I just want to express my appreciation mm, to Dennis once you. again for a stimulating and challenging lecture series. Uh, Dennis does have a couple of copies of his newest book, Might from the Margins, available for sale. And he's told me he accepts credit. Uh, so if you've got a card and not cash, uh, those will be on sale just up here. You can meet Dennis afterwards for uh, $12. There are only a few copies, uh, but they, he did just tell me the price on Amazon has gone down recently as well. So available there if you don't get one today. Would you join me in welcoming once again, Dr. Dennis Edwards. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you again. I I do consider it a privilege to be with you, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk um, about anything, pretty much, but also the opportunity to talk about things I've worked on and thought about, so I'm grateful for that. <clears throat> I want to say thanks again to uh, Dr. Frank Dick, and he, he and I had have had some good conversation just the last uh, day, and I'm um, grateful for you. Thank you. appreciated the um, hospitality shown to me. I was commenting earlier to have a goodie bag at the hotel. Little things like that mean a lot to me, so thank you. And, uh, and then to be able to have lunch and um, um, enjoy a meal together in this, this town, I'm grateful. Also grateful for how carefully um, he and, and uh, Brian Lowry read, read my book to ask me those questions at noon. I was starting to forget some things I had said myself because the book had, it had been finished for a while, even though it just came out in September. So I appreciate when folks read what I do carefully and have some good questions about it. And, and even, even pushback is fine because it helps you to refine ideas. I come uh, heavily sharing in an Anabaptist tradition that there's a uh, hermeneutical co community that we can discern truth together. So when there's pushback, that just simply helps me to think through my, my argument and my exegesis and makes me uh, hopefully more careful about things. Um, so I'm going to get into our topic for this afternoon, the power of love. Uh, once again, Lord, we give you thanks because you're good and your mercies endure forever. And thank you, Lord God, that you see fit to visit your people and to minister to us, to speak to us today, even from words written so long ago. Help us, Lord God, to be like those men of Issachar who discern the times. Help us to know how we can let your words find home in our hearts and then our actions be impactful in our day and age. I pray that you would help me to speak uh, clearly and in a way that is helpful. <clears throat> and Lord, even though we uh, can't all see each other fully and, and this uh, pandemic is preventing us from having the closeness that we uh, crave and desire, we are still trusting, Lord, that you can have your message go forth. You can help us to grow in love for you and for one another. And Lord, somehow we can anticipate that we will come through this and hopefully your people will have learned and become even better because that's what adversity can do. So I pray, Lord God, for your will in this moment in the name of our Lord Jesus, amen. So you've heard, if you heard any of my presentation this morning, that not only do I teach New Testament, and I've been teaching for about 20 years, I um, was also a pastor and started working in churches since 1987. So I stopped full-time work in church in 2017, so that's about 30 years. And um, so right now I do want to be, I'll probably be more pastoral than academic. This morning I did give you a bunch of quotes and tried to show you some literature as well as make a case from First Peter of how marginalized people represent Jesus to this world. And, and as I say that, it might sound kind of simple when you think about it, but, but um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that folks on the margins are not to be pitied or even just admired, but actually are folks who teach us, who can help shape us in, in our discipleship help us to understand what Jesus is like and what the way of the world is like. And marginalization is not something that God institutes. It's something that people do to other people. Um, 
I had somebody, I gave a presentation on this, and he said, well, you know, African-American people are just 12 percent of the population. Of course, you should expect to be marginalized. And I thought, oh, somehow he was understanding marginalization in terms of numbers. And that's the very thing I was trying not to say, that it's about power, not about numbers. I mean, I mean look at South Africa. You had a, a white minority that was oppressing a black majority. It wasn't about numbers. Marginalization is about power. So that's what I've been talking about. But I'm going to shift, well, not shift, I just will probably be a little more pastoral, but I still will hopefully engage some scripture passages, and you will still get a few quotes along the way. This is actually the last chapter of my book is called The Power of Love. And uh, it almost feel obligatory because I've been in so many settings where you talk about heavy topics like race or you talk about heavy topics about oppression or suffering. And, and people like, the, the, the question they'll ask at the end is, do you have any hope? You know, what hope can you give us? So that's my next to last chapter, I think, is the power of hope or close to the last chapter. And last was the power of love. Because in my experience, when we talk about race, especially in, in Christian context, and I would say especially in Christian context, the anxiety level rises for white people and a degree of PTSD sets in for people of color, a little bit of post-traumatic stress disorder, and I, and I mean that pretty seriously. As for the anxiety, it's clear that not many white people want to be accused of being racist or being associated with racism because nobody wants that. I mean, <laughs> Maybe you saw a video that was uh, from a few years ago, but it, it went viral recently. I mean, just like days ago. And uh, I couldn't figure out an easy way to show it, although I did go to the Internet to see if I could show it here, but get into difficulty trying to get um, videos from things to show in public settings. But um, it's from a PBS show, Frontline, so it would be easy to find. And the title of the series that they had done or this interview story was called or is called Poverty, Politics, and Profit. So it'd be easy to find, Poverty, Politics, and Profit. The clip that went viral recently was of a woman being interviewed, and it's a, it was a white woman in a comfortable community in Texas, and she was being asked why she opposed affordable housing being available in her community. So she touted pretty much every stereotype about poor and otherwise marginalized people and all the while, she made these disclaimers like, I know this sounds terrible, but. And then she also said, I'm not a racist, but. And, and at one point, the, the uh, interviewer asked, well, you mentioned poor kids of single mothers. She said, well, don't you think they deserve the same educational opportunity as your kids? And she said, no. She said, I, I don't. Uh, crave what the billionaires have who live in luxury, and I don't expect that I should have what they have, so why should they expect to have what I have? So now, I've got no desire really to single this woman out. She's just serving as a really pertinent example. But I could easily imagine her, especially in the community that they were, were uh, showing us, I could easily imagine her being a regular churchgoer, probably taking her kids to Sunday school, maybe even singing in the choir. I can imagine her faithfully paying money to the church and being a very faithful man. In fact, so many people would probably say she's a really nice woman. And this is the part of the problem is that people think when we talk about power and privilege and whiteness and marginalization that we're talking about nice and, and kind versus mean. That's not even an issue. We're talking about power structures like we talked about at lunch. We're talking about principal, principalities and powers. We're talking about systems at work that people tap into. But in that short clip, it's easy to participate in racism without seeing it. That's my point, is that, or, 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 or even to see the racism, but, but not wanting to acknowledge the power of it. The woman demonstrated this privilege of being able to distance herself from the problem of homelessness, caricature the families that were in desperate need, and then she was able to absolve herself from any personal responsibility or any culpability. That's what privilege allows people to do, is to not see themselves connected to the issue at all. <clears throat> so I understand that few white people want to see themselves as participating in the injustice of racism. It's that woman saying, I'm not a racist, but... I mean, maybe hardcore white supremacists are okay with it, but most white people, especially Christians, want to see themselves as loving everyone. I mean, it's not unusual to hear Christians with 
white Christians particularly, with all sincerity, say things like, well, I don't see color. And that myth of colorblindness, instead of dismantling racism, actually serves to uphold it because colorblindness holds onto assumptions about race without expressing them. Colorblindness refuses to respect and celebrate the diversity of God's creation. It almost just assumes that if you saw a color, it would be bad. But actually, that's not my main point right now. But suffice to say that few white people desire to be complicit in racism. So that's why this anxiety level comes up when the topic is approached. And as for the PTSD, for the post-traumatic stress disorder, sometimes, well, I would say oftentimes, marginalized people, the ones best able to discern the injustice, I make that case in the book, and then speak prophetically to it, are asked to address the same problems that have persisted, well, for generations. We're supposed to do that and not have it take a toll on us. So I stand here, and I can't help but to think of many Christian contexts that I've spoken in over the years. And I mean, I'm not a popular speaker, but I've spoken in a lot of places at my age now, churches, Christian camps a lot, clergy meetings, classrooms. I tried to give them all with C's, but anyway, churches, camps, clergy meetings, classrooms. I've spoken a lot, and, and, and I've had people at the end of it minimize me, demonize me, otherwise dismiss me. And I remember those times, and I remember things, you know, frequently in my mind, and I sometimes feel in my body the physical reaction of wanting to withdraw, to close my mouth, to disappear. That's sort of a PTSD. I've been in settings even where there might be an African-American speaker, and I've won a few African-American people sitting there in the, in the audience. And then you have this pressure of feeling like, do are all my alleged friends going to now treat me differently because if I nod in agreement with that preacher or that speaker, now there's a spotlight on me. And, and, I, and I respect that because I'm going to drive back to the Chicago metro when this is over, and you might be mad at me and there's social media, so you might, you know, have an opportunity to say something about me or whatever, but I'll be physically gone. And then members of the community have to stay and remain and deal with these kinds of things. I am very much understanding of this. That's been my life. So I really do acknowledge that. I'm trying to say all of this up front because I have experience with the kinds of feelings that come up when we talk about privilege and power. No, nobody wants to be painted in any, with any broad brushes, which is why I said at lunch it's so important to know people's stories. When we do get to the issues of race, and then we come close to the end of our messages, and I say we, meaning people who speak on these topics, there is an inevitable question that comes up, and we already talked about it at lunch. Like, what do we do? What should we do? And the answer is the same. We can ask uh, Dr. Frank Dyken, an expert in the book of Acts, because it's the answer that they get in Acts. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission. He said, this is always the answer. Repent. You don't just repent once in your life. When you become aware of something that's true, you repent. And you turn, you reorient yourself to the things. So when people ask, what should we do? There's an awkwardness here because for the marginalized person, there's a pressure to say, instead of telling you repent, it's like, well, we'll all be okay. Don't worry. I was telling you all this tough stuff, but really there's a lot of hope right now. So there's this pressure that we feel, right, that we have had to face injustice, diagnose the injustice, prophetically speak against the injustice, and then we're asked to kind of solve the problem too. So when we talk about love, oftentimes people of color are, are expected to ease white people's anxiety, to bring the temperature down. And of course, we feel the pressure to do that. I mean, we want to protect ourselves. Nobody wants to be, you know, scolded with their eyes. We don't want to deliberately make enemies. But when we're pressured to solve problems that white Christianity created, we can feel once again as if our role in life is to serve white people and to make them be more whole and holy. It's enough for us to try to work on being whole and holy. Now, I do have African-American friends who readily take on the task, and I did when I was younger. I was eager. 
You know, any, any speaking opportunity. I mean, when you're a young preacher, you take any opportunity. And sometimes it comes with an honorarium. So you say, praise the Lord, 25 bucks, I can put some gas in the car. Oh, I got some horror stories, but I think all the preachers in here could understand what I'm talking about. You tend to say yes to these things. And little did I know how difficult it would be and how people would be so upset with me. I remember one time I'm speaking at a Christian camp. And this father, who I had sat next to the night before when, you know, you arrive on the Saturday and then camp kicks off on Sunday. So people are unpacking and eating dinner. And this was up in New Hampshire. And, uh, and he, he, you know, a very patriotic guy. He had a big American flag on his shirt. His kids had big American flags on their shirts. And they were all excited for the week of camp. Now, I had been a camp speaker at this camp 10 summers in a row. At this point, it was probably maybe around my third or fourth summer. So I had been there before. I wasn't new to the camp. But he was new. He didn't know me. So we happened to be sitting at the same meal. He didn't know who the speaker was, so he was reflecting on what he was hoping for for camp and everything. And, uh, and it was nice. And then later, you know, during the week after he's heard me a couple of times, he was a little agitated. And I thought, my goodness, I didn't think I said anything really tough. But, he, but I had said some things about black and white folks working together. And I don't even know if I just said black and white. I might have talked about just cross-cultural things because it tends to come up in my presentations. So he was agitated, and he came to talk to me. And it turned out that he was, he was um, really upset because the church he went to, his pastor and he were close, and, and the pastor was telling him about a family, African-American family that was in the church that left. And when they left, the father of the family said, look, I don't have to be white to be Christian and left. And this guy just couldn't understand this. And he said, what, what is he talking about? He said, we just do things by the Bible. Which nowadays, you know, thinking about, what is this, about 20 years later, I always just find that intriguing and funny to do it by the Bible. What does that mean? They take people out and stone them? I, don't, I mean, so I, anyway, there's a lot of stuff that's in the Bible. But anyway, I said to him, well, I think I know what you mean. I said, but let's just think about it. You meet probably 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. I said, is that in the Bible? I said, you sing songs written by European hymnologists. Is that in the Bible? I, so I, I listed a bunch of things, and I said, you do what's culturally comfortable and convenient for you that you learned. And he just, he just couldn't get around that. And this is like one of our problems right there, right? So there's this difficulty that we have in trying. So, so it was like he was coming to me to kind of ease his tension about this man, this family that left the church. And I, 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 I couldn't do that for him. I couldn't solve that for him. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm talking about love. I'm trying to get there and just to talk about the difficulty associated with that because there's a pressure to leave here feeling better. Or, no, that's not the pressure. The pressure is for me to make you feel better. <laughs> and yet as I talk about love, it might not be exactly what you're expecting. Because over the years, I found that talking about love between marginalized people in a dominant culture gets reduced to talking, as I said before, about proximity and not patterns of power. So the solutions for racism that were popular when I, back in the 80s and in the early 90s when I was just kind of starting out doing this, this kind of uh, ministry, the solutions were always pretty much the same. You know, a white pastor hiring an African-American worship leader or having potluck dinners or pulpit exchanges. And some of that is actually pretty nice and fun and good basic things. So I don't want to disparage stuff. But they have the potential of getting people, you know, who are different from each other, at least near each other. That's all good, provided, you know, there's no pandemic. But those programs for proximity fail to address the underlying issue that I was writing about in the book. The underlying issue is one of power. Who listens to whom? Who submits to whom? I mean, who learns from whom? Who gets authority? I mean, there's so many questions. I, I may have said it this morning. I'm not sure. But I have met a lot of pastors who would say to me, well, our church is so diverse. It's like the United Nations. I think I said that to you. And I, and I just found that intriguing because I grew up in New York. And for me, the United Nations is not one white guy up in front with a few people who are different sitting there. I always thought of the United Nations as a much more equitable kind of, uh, kind of a gathering. So I have found that for some people the answer was proximity. And I keep saying it's really about power. And power questions get answered with love. I mean, the love of Jesus is always the answer. So my message is about love. But it's not about holding hands and singing kumbaya. Because back in my day, 
when I was around your age, the messages on racial reconciliation, because that's what we called it then, would always end with a you know, contemporary Christian song. Now, we just had a ball talking about contemporary Christian songs in the car. Um, I, won't, I won't elaborate on all we said, but we found out there was a church nearby that had Carmen in concert, live in concert. So that sparked a big uh, reminiscing for us about Christian music from, now I'm older than these guys, so I'm, but I'm remembering Christian music in the, well, for me, it was in a gospel world, but also the contemporary Christian world. But we would have these talks on racial reconciliation. This is in the uh, 80s, particularly in the early 90s, and they would always end with a Russ, Russ Taft song. You're my brother, you're my sister, so take me by the hand. Together we will work until he comes. There's no foe that can defeat us when we're walking side by side. As long as there is love, we will stand. Beautiful song. But it's not going to solve our power problem. But that's how they always end it. And it is kind of cool. There's, there's, there's nice sentiment there, right? But we need more than the sentimentality. We need a new mindset. That's repentance. That's the change. So the first thing I really want to stress is just the security of feeling loved by God. And I think everyone involved in these conversations needs to feel the security of God's love. I'm going to share just a little bit of my own journey. You heard a little bit of my academic journey, but I, I do want to tell you my childhood journey just a little bit. Don't worry, I'm not going to get into, you know, this is your life, Dennis. Um, just a little bit because I think it's relevant here. But I, so I grew up in the 60s. And the, uh, but I was, I mean, a little kid. I was born in 60. I kind of have a hard time saying it because that means this year I turned 60. Um, so it's just, a f I, I was born just a few years after the Brown versus Board of Education school desegregation case, just a few years. So people were trying to figure out how to integrate schools back then. And uh, so they were starting to bus kids, often African-American kids to white neighborhoods. I mean, they were not going to bus white kids to black neighborhoods. White people weren't going to stand for that. But they would, they, would, they would bus us to white neighborhoods. So my brother, my next older brother was, um, was, was an experiment in our family. So he went first and was bused from one part of Queens to a fancy part of Queens, Douglas in Queens, um, which is a fancy neighborhood. If you ever heard of the tennis great John McEnroe, he played at the Douglas in Club there in, in, in uh, Queens, really fancy place. So here I was having this school world that was different from my neighborhood world, which was also different from my church world, because my church world was also African-American. But I also went to a church that wasn't sort of mainstream Christian church. I didn't go to a Baptist, uh, black Baptist church that's a stereotype for a lot of people. I went to a little holiness church. They call themselves holiness, apostolic, Jesus only, oneness theology, not a trinity. They believed that you had to be, you had to uh, uh, be baptized in the name of Jesus, not Father, Son, Holy Ghost. You had to speak in tongues, not as a second blessing. That was, if you didn't speak in tongues, you weren't saved. And I have a lot I can say about it. That's a book in it of itself, but nobody would read it except my family because they, cause I, cause they would want to know, really, Dad, you went through all of that? Because uh, I've told them stories from time to time. But in that scenario, for a scientific-minded introvert kid like me, the idea of speaking in tongues was phenomenal, that God was going to take control of my tongue and make me speak in a language I didn't have to learn in school. This is awesome. I'm, I'm, sign me up for this. But it meant I had to come forward in church in front of everybody. So that slowed down the process a little bit for me, an introvert. But I did. I eventually did when I was 13. And then I got baptized because they believe it's necessary for salvation. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And so the pool is always filled. So when you come forward, you, you change your clothes, and they just make the service go a little longer. You change your clothes, you get baptized. And, they, and so I came out there, but I wasn't speaking in tongues. So I had to go to prayer meetings. I started going to prayer meetings for about five years from when I was 13 to I was 18, went off to college, and even some after that. I went every Wednesday. If it was a revival, I went several times in a week. Now, I don't have time to tell you all of this because I, I want to get into the topic here, but I'm trying to get you to see this intensity of what church was for me because I wasn't speaking in tongues. There was a mindset that I had not yet met with God's approval for him to give me this gift. 
So I'm coming to church as frequently as, it, as more than any normal teenager going to church to try to show God that I'm serious about this so that I could get this gift and be saved and these people would get off my back because every time I would ask, what's wrong with me? Why am I not saved? They say, well, Dennis, you haven't fully repented yet. God didn't allow us to do anything. What's left to repent of? We can't go to movies. We can't get, listen to secular music. Dayton, you know, be careful about that. I mean, there were so many things that we could not do. I thought, oh my goodness, what is left to repent of? So now I'm thinking every thought that's popping into my head is probably a sin, so I've got to repent that. I had a pretty difficult relationship with God during my teenage years. I didn't think God loved me. And, and judging by the way things were in church, you had to be an extrovert. I didn't know the language of introvert, extrovert back then. But you had to act like those people who were jumping and shouting and falling over the pews, and that wasn't going to be me. And if I didn't do that, then God wasn't going to love me. I was in a quagmire. This was a difficult place. And then I go to school, and I'm around all these white kids, and I'm almost always the only black kid in my class or one of two black kids in my class. And then so you, you can't help but to pick up the way people will talk about blackness, things that they're learning at home. And, you're, and you, so you can't help but to feel like you're not really as significant or as important as those people, or there's something wrong with you or different with you. So I go off. I go to an Ivy League school. And sometime later, I go off to Trinity Seminary. I remember sitting in seminary. I'm sitting like right in the front of class because I'm trying real hard to show that I'm a, a, a good student. Plus, I'm coming from a science world into this seminary world, whatever this is. And I'm sitting there. And I remember in this history class, the, question, the professor asked where did he leave off last time. I answered where he left off. And he starts mocking me in some kind of southern sleeve, tap, die, leg, blah, 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 mumbling like. And I'm sitting there like. I talk like that? I'm from New York. And he's like making fun of what I just said. This is the professor. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm, what I can't understand is why nobody else sees this as a problem. So I said, so this is how it is in seminary too. These are Jesus people. My ethics professor, a famous evangelical, if I said his name, every, most of the people, you know, even younger than me would know who I'm talking about. He has since passed away, though. He didn't, he, I, we had taken a class in ethics, and I asked, you know, would we ever talk about racism? I think that's an ethical issue, and he embarrasses me in front of the whole class for bringing up this topic. So it, it made me feel that theological education had no place for non-white people, at least at that, that school. And finally, when I passed my oral defense for my doctorate, I remember the dean coming in, you know, those are emotional moments that us, everybody here who's got a doctorate can relate to this. So the dean comes in, congratulates me, calls me doctor for the first time. So I start crying because, you know, it's very emotional. And then he tells me, you know, you're the first African-American to earn the PhD in biblical studies here at Catholic University. And, and it, it hit me in a very sobering kind of way. So what I'm trying to tell you is all along my journey, I needed to know that God loved me and that I actually belonged in the places I was at. Because my church didn't help me to understand God loved me. The, the, the theological world around me didn't always treat me as if God loved me. But we all need to be confident in God's love. If we are to battle injustice, white people need to feel God's love. God loves white people so they don't need to be insecure when people are talking about power and privilege. Because you are made in the image of God, I am made in the image of God. But it's not because we are, anyone is inherently more God-like than anybody else. Marginalized people also need to feel secure in God's love because society challenges our worth on a regular basis, even in unexpected ways. When the kingdom of Judah was in pain, facing Babylonian captivity, God raised up this prophet Jeremiah, breaking through the gloom and the doom. And the word comes from Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That needs to seep in to all of us. Because when we tackle challenges like injustice, there's this tendency people have, they might not say it, they might not even realize they're feeling it, but there's this tendency to think, if I don't get my way, there's something like they're missing something, some part of them. God loves you, period. 
if we're to progress as God's people to dismantle injustice, we need to understand the love of God, not just intellectually, but to feel it deep inside. And the security of God's love allows us to face the challenges of a sinful world. So when I'm talking about love, I'm going to start there. Security in God's love more than hand-holding and singing Kumbaya or even Rust Half. But not only do I experience God's love and feel secure in it, I need to love my neighbor as myself. So hopefully I don't have to tell folks at a Christian university that Jesus said those words, love your neighbor as yourself, and more than one occasion. There are words from Le Leviticus in the Old Testament, echoed by Paul in the New Testament. When we are secure in God's love, we can love others freely, love lavishly, the way God loves us. The challenge here builds from my first point, though. Part of the problem of loving our neighbors is dealing with the way Christianity has viewed people of color. And I speak particularly now from an African-American context because that's my own context that I know best and feel um, most capable talking about. But the issue goes beyond just my people. So sadly, Christianity has contributed to racial self-hatred. What I mean by racial self-hatred is the difficulty that many people of color have in seeing themselves as people of worth. My friend Shaniqua Walker Barnes, she writes in her book, I Bring the Voices of My People, A Womanist Vision for Racial Reconciliation. She says this, when people of color internalize the view that whiteness is superior to all other races, including their own, we call this internalized oppression. And this actually does happen. Now, there is little biological variation among human beings. I mean, all humans are 99.9% .9 identical in their genetic makeup according to the hum Human Genome Project. So on a basic level, that scientific reality is compatible with the Apostle Paul's assertion in Acts 17, 26, where he communicates through Luke, uh, his writing anyway, is telling us that his Jew Paul's Jewish understanding of the origins of humanity he's giving to this crowd in Athens. And he says this, from one ancestor, he, that would be God, made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. So with this phrase, part of the larger speech that Paul is giving there, he spotlights Adam, this prototypical human. And the apostle is emphasizing that all humans descend from the same parent. And Paul's rhetorical uh, uh, presentation acknowledging the humanity of all human beings is, you know, it's, it's not a modern discussion of genetics. Of course not. And, and neither is Genesis for that matter. Yet, the science seems to confirm what the scriptures are saying about the commonality of human beings. Given the, re the reality of humanity's overwhelmingly uh, similar genetic makeup, questions start emerging regarding the physical and cultural differences that do exist among humans, and we find ourselves pondering what might be God's intentions in light of these differences. So we're forced to reckon with the history of violence due to these differences. We're confronted with Christianity's ambiguous role in either exploiting or embracing human differences. For instance, dark skin has been vilified for eons. But what I found kind of remarkable as I'm working on another book is that this passage in, in Numbers, I didn't put up on the screen because I'm just now remembering it, but in Numbers 12 where, where uh, uh, um, the, the sister and brother of Moses, you know, Miriam and Aaron, are upset that he married a Cushite woman, and, uh, and then God brings judgment and he makes Miriam's skin white with leprosy. That in that interchange, it says, you know, Moses is the most humble man on the face of the earth, which uh, is just this parenthetical comment there. But in that issue of being a Cushite woman, she's African, whoever he's married. There's a textual variant, actually, that says beautiful. So this is interesting. So according to the Jewish, uh, I'm sorry, the, to the uh, Jewish study Bible, that uh, there was thinking that Africans were beautiful, and, you know, which is why this variant is there. And I thought, well, that's interesting, because by the time Christianity came along, anything African and dark was considered ugly. And white Europeans' quest to seize power had this really negative impact on the indigenous people of other continents. I mean, dark-skinned residents, just think about it, Australia, Africa, North America, Central America, South America, continually struggle to make sense of the mixed legacy of European imperialism, colonialism, 
continues to be deconstructed now, even among Christians. But philosophy, science, religion, politics, economics, art, a host of other disciplines all conspired to elevate white Europeans while demonizing dark-skinned people. This didn't just happen overnight. This is happening for years and years and years and years. And despite the Apostle Paul's image of one humanity shared by one common ancestor, Christianity was complicit in denying the humanity of dark-skinned people as if those black lives did not matter. So consider the so-called curse of Ham. You have heard this in Genesis 9, 20 to 27. I'm not going to read all of this to you just for time's sake, but I'm going to jump in at 24. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, lowest of slaves shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed, uh, by, the Lord, uh, blessed by the Lord my God be Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. May God make peace for Japheth, and let him live in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. There's so many weird things about this passage, just as it is. <laughs> but the way it was used... It's, it's also odd because it's been called the curse of Ham, and Ham's not even cursed here, right? I mean, it's, it's Canaan that's cursed, but I'll let the Old Testament process work that through. But there's a couple of African-American scholars who make this comment of how this passage was used, and that's actually what I want you to, to, to catch. In the 19th century, this story became one of the most popular myths promulgated for the purpose of shaping popular perceptions among religious people and developing the ideology necessary for maintaining the peculiar social institution of slavery. The so-called Curse of Ham tradition was widely appropriated as biblical warrant to maintain the link between race and prevailing slaveocracy. Since the biblical narrative omits racial designation, African-American interpreters responded to conjectures of coloration in Genesis 9. Rarely, however, was Genesis 9 utilized by the formerly enslaved to discuss the origins of whiteness. In other words, they're saying black interpreters of the Bible, even way back then, didn't see in this passage anything about color. But white folks used this passage. And you think, wow, that was such a long time ago, 19th century. Oh, my goodness, I'm going to church in the middle of the 20th century, and that's what was taught in my church, in a black church. I mean, when the questions came up of why we were slaves, they said, well, God cursed us. This is how pervasive this, this notion was, that we were by God's design inferior to other human beings. And this, so, that, so that's, that you got to figure that this is part and parcel of the way Christianity was operating. Consider now the second century, this is an apocryphal writing, so I don't want to be branded as a heretic. It's not in the Bible. I'm not saying it should be in the Bible. So that's just a little disclaimer. But this is a second century writing called the Acts of Peter. This is a kind of a lengthy quote, but I'll try to make it engaging. And Marcellus went to sleep for a short time, and when he awoke, he said to Peter, Peter, apostle of Christ, let us boldly set about our task. For just now, as I slept for a little, I saw you sitting on a high place, and before you a great assembly and a most evil-looking woman who looked like an Ethiopian, not an Egyptian, but was all black, clothed in filthy rags. She was dancing with an iron collar about her neck and chains on her hands and feet. When you saw her, you said aloud to me, Marcellus, the whole power of Simon and his God is this dancer. Take off her head. But I said to you, Brother Peter, I am a senator of noble, fa noble family, and I have never stained my hands nor killed even a sparrow at any time. And when you heard this, you began to cry out even louder, Come, our true sword, Jesus Christ, and do not only cut off the head of this demon, but cut in pieces all her limbs in the sight of all these whom I have approved in thy service. And immediately, a man who looked like yourself, Peter, with sword in hand, cut her all to pieces, so that I gazed upon you both, both on you and the one who was cutting up the demon whose likeness caused me great amazement. And now I have awakened and told you these signs of Christ. And when Peter heard this, he was the more encouraged because Marcellus had seen these things, for the Lord is always careful for his own. So cheered and refreshed, <laughs> I started to put the Latin in there, sorry. Uh, by these words, he stood up to go to the forum. This text was brought to my attention from, by a scholar, uh, Gay Byron, and she, she comments on it, and she says, it's hard to believe that this text was written during the formative years of early Christianity. It was intended to inspire, encourage, and edify those who would receive it. And then she goes on to say, it is clear that assumptions about ethnic and color differences in antiquity influenced the way Christians shaped their stories 
about the theological, ecclesiological, and political developments within the early Christian communities. As a result, Ethiopians, rather Egyptians, Ethiopians, blacks and blackness, that's a phrase she repeats throughout the book, um, set of four there, Egyptians, Ethiopians, blacks and blackness, invariably became associated with the threats and dangers that could potentially destroy the development of a certain orthodox brand of Christianity. In other words, and she traces in the book, black, blackness as a concept, but also as it appears on people, was assigned to be evil. So black became synonymous with evil. The association remains with us. I mean, for example, the popular evangelical gospel presentation, the wordless book, it's, numerable, it's innumerable variations that are not books, like bracelets and jelly beans, in which colors are used to lead children to Christ. Some of you may have seen it. Red represents the blood of Jesus. But of course, black represents sinful humans. And you might think, well, it's not that big a deal. But it's part and parcel of the bigger picture of blackness always being assigned as negative. We're not talking about dark. We're not talking about the, a shade of evil. So black, of course, is to be avoided. But God saves people and doesn't change our skin color. <laughs> Indeed, our ethnic identity, including racial distinctions, if there is such a thing, even though race is a human construct, but it relates to other things like <laughs> ethnicity and nationality and so on, but whatever these distinctions are, they appear to carry over into the afterlife because we see at least the breadth of humanity in Revelation 7 that represents at least the ethnic differences there. And we were talking about this earlier, uh, Dr. Frank and I. After this, I looked. There was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. That's more the ethnic diversity, right? Tribes, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. So amen for the beauty of the diversity of God's elect. The challenge is for us to see that beauty even now. So I'm talking about love. I'm talking about being secure in God's love, but I'm talking about being able to love ourselves, especially if we're marginalized people, so that we can love others as ourselves. I'm a little bit sad that I had some students in a doctor ministry class who had never heard of Kenneth and Mamie Clark. I had one African-American student in the class. He was the only one who had heard of them. Um, Kenneth and Mamie Clark, I mean, their life is amazing for a lot of reasons. One of them is that, you know, you got two African-American PhDs back in the early 20th century. That was already a big deal. But their most famous experiment, perhaps, is this one with the dolls that you may have heard of. Their work influenced Thur Thurgood Marshall, who was working with the NAACP towards school desegregation in that Brown versus Board of Education case that I mentioned earlier. And part of his argument was based on their research where uh, children were shown dolls of different colors and and asked about traits like goodness and kindness and pretty and all those kinds of things. And most of all the students, including the black students, uh, viewed white as better consistently. They had been conditioned to see themselves negatively. So this contemporary phrase, Black Lives Matter, which is so offensive to a lot of people for some strange reason, is offered as fuel for our self-love. It's an anti-brutality slogan, yes, but it also serves to remind us of our inherent worth. I mean, in my era, it was James Brown singing, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And, and while some white people may have taken that to be offensive, we needed an affirmation after years of beatdown. We needed to be able to say black is beautiful to ourselves, to each other. Now, I know white people often get agi agitated with these affirmations of self-love from black people, but when your people have been so marginalized for centuries, you need to find affirmation. So we looked for it in visual art, in TV, in, mu in movies, in music, wherever we could find it. Many African Americans in my era left the church for the Nation of Islam and other groups because they found affirmation and love there. They, d they didn't have to contend with a white Jesus or with those who would defend white supremacy. Another reason why I mentioned to you I wrote my From the Margins is so that African American people would not need to reject Christianity because of the way it had been used against us. 
So if we are to love our neighbors as ourselves, we need to be able to love ourselves. But self-love is not based on a fictional notion of superiority or a socially constructed system of dominance. Self-love is based on the notion that all people are made in the image of God. Whatever that image entails, all humanity shares it. As the psalmist says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. That I know very well. So in order to experience the power of love, especially with regard to questions of race, privilege, and power, I said that we must feel secure in God's love. We need to learn to love ourselves so that we can love others well. And next, I submit that we must appreciate that love is honest. So you might be familiar with 1 Corinthians 13, that love chapter from weddings. We call it the love chapter. We read it at weddings. I'm sure Paul did not write it with a wedding homily in view, but that's how we use it. But he was trying to eliminate factionalism and division within the Christian community at Corinth. Paul was trying to get them to be reconciled to each other. And this is part of what he wrote. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is, envy, is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So when, love, when Paul says that love rejoices in the truth, I take that to mean that love should be honest. Now, of course, the truth to Paul could start with, and I think for all of us, with the truth about Christ, but it would also encompass the truth of the situation under scrutiny, because Paul will, dis in that book, discusses a lot of different situations meals, marriage, the resurrection, spiritual gifts, so much more. So love doesn't just tolerate the truth, it rejoices in the truth. So I return to the theologian Miroslav Wolf, who writes of the moral obligation to remember truthfully in the quest for justice in this movement toward unity. He says, so the obligation to truthfulness and remembering is at its root an obligation to do justice, even such a seemingly simple act as the naming of what one person has done to another. Naming, as simple as it sounds, is so hard, especially I found in the dominant culture. There's a tendency, in fact, we're seeing it right now, to take things out of school curriculum so we don't even have to name the bad things. It's sad and scary that when historians and others mention racism, they get viewed as the enemy. We should know that the USA was built on the genocide of Native Americans. To say it, to name it. The dehumanization of Africans, the exploitation of Asians, and I'm thinking right now particularly of the Chinese who built the railroads, for example. There's this famous picture of when the East meets the West and the railroad is complete across the country, and you see people joining hands, and it's like a celebratory picture. I was going, should have got it off the internet. You look in that whole picture, and it's all white people. You don't even see the Chinese in the picture. They built this railroad. The dangerous, backbreaking work done by Chinese laborers. There's no question that racism is woven into the fabric of America. But the scared, scary and sad point is that white dominant society wants to ignore the reality. So instead of telling the truth and rejoicing in the truth to get to the truth, because Jesus says the truth will set us free, powerful people in our country, yeah, and it does include the president in this case, would prefer that we not even acknowledge the evil parts of history. I'm reading, or I read the book Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. I've mentioned her twice now. She wrote a book called The Warmth of Other Sons, and this one called Cast. And in her discussion of Cast, she gives this lengthy discussion of what happens in Germany and how in Germany you cannot exist without being constantly reminded of what happened uh, with Nazism. It's constantly, in fact, you get people who will even de debate, do we still have to keep talking about this? And the answer is always yes, because they want every generation to know this is not going to happen again. And how will we know that? Because we'll keep telling you what happened. Yet here we go with the opposite. Let's not talk about it, because people will be mad. And that's the Christians. Miroslav Volf is saying the obligation to truthfulness and remembering is at its root an obligation to do justice. 
So yes, that brings us to forgiveness. That's certainly an aspect of love. And forgiveness releases our souls from a burden. And that burden is hatred. We have to let hatred go. And sometimes we see stories of victims publicly forgiving those who perpetrated injustice against them or against the loved one. And that's cool. And I've seen that. But forgiveness isn't a performance. It takes place within us when we give over any desire for revenge. Forgiveness takes seriously God saying, vengeance is mine, I will repay. So I want to point out, however, that while forgiveness is certainly expected of God's people, there is still room for anger over injustice. Anger is a secondary emotion, and it flares up in the face of injustice. But rather than stuff down anger, it needs to work itself out. Paul says, be angry, but do not sin. Don't, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't make room for the devil. I was going to spend some time working on that, and I'm realizing I'm, uh, okay, I better be careful here about my time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump from talking about Paul to just give you two quick examples of, of angry Jesus. I say it that way kind of on purpose because we don't think of Jesus as angry except with some theoretical people over there. He can't possibly be angry with the way we're doing things. And in Mark chapter 3, it tells the story of Jesus entering the synagogue a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm in the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger, with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Oh my goodness. They had a miracle take place right in front of them and they want to kill Jesus. And the Pharisees and the Herodians didn't even get along with each other, but they do now. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, apparently. So, so we've got... Jesus angry when you've got these people more concerned about law and order than they are about the man who's struggling. They worried about the Sabbath, and Jesus worried about a man with a withered, withered hand. In chapter 10, people were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Why was Jesus indignant? I mean, the disciples were preventing the children from getting their blessing. Children had no voice in that society, you know, to be seen and not heard. And, and Jesus is angry, indignant, it says, or at least this translation, that those who had no voice are prevented and pushed aside and seen as an inconvenience. Could Jesus still be angry when we would rather keep our laws from preventing people from finding healing or, or decorum from finding their blessing? I think that would make Jesus angry. So my point about love being honest is to say that love demands justice. And this would be my final point, because I use that term justice now. I used to be involved in groups that would talk about racial reconciliation, and that was a popular term. But I say racial justice now um, because it's about power, as I've said many times. Scholar and church leader Curtis DeYoung has written extensively on race and reconciliation. And he co-authored a book with the South African professor, Alan Bosek, and they comment on the reconciliation versus justice idea that I'm talking about. He, they say far too many initiatives for reconciliation and social justice stop short of completing the work required. In our work and engagement with reconciliation, we've discovered how often reconciliation is used merely to reach some political accommodation that did not address the critical questions of justice, equality, and dignity that are so prominent in the biblical understanding of reconciliation. Such political arrangements invariably favor the rich and powerful, but deprive the powerless of justice and dignity. Yet more often than not, this reconciliation is presented as if it does respond to the needs for genuine reconciliation and employs a language that sounds like the truth, but is in fact deceitful. That's a pretty strong statement. And if you notice the reference, that's on page one. That's where they start, <laughs> right? Well, I had, there's more I was going to say. I was going to quote Miroslav Wolf, but let me, let me press on because I want to finish up here to tell you that f to, to, for Miroslav Wolf, forgiveness is certainly part. And he talks about releasing, but he talks about releasing people from the debt, but also not having amnesia. 
that there is a certain memory uh, about what has happened. But the goal, again, is to love. Love has to be radical and not politicized. So I end a little lightheartedly here, because a lot of my life I was taught that racism was really just a bigotry problem, and I still hear that from time to time, which is why Christians, I hear some of them upset about critical race theory, because they don't want to think about the power, they think it's about just bigotry, like, I just, have to, I just have to like you. And it's not about like, you can like me just fine, and still participate in a system that doesn't let me buy a house in your town. You could like me just fine and not have a, 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 and be part of a policy that doesn't let my kids come to your school. See, that's what I'm saying. It's about power. It's not whether you like me or not. But a lot of my, a lot of years of life, I thought that. And that's the way I was taught because in the 70s, that's the way we were, we were taught was the problem, was just a bigotry problem. So all the television shows of my childhood, many of them were all, were, were, were Norman Lear shows, almost all of them. All in the Family was one that we watched. Some of you might be re remember, boy, the way Glenn Miller played. The Jeffersons, well, we're moving on up. Sanford and Son, they didn't have words. Bump, 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 bump. Anyway, you're all too young. And Good Times, ain't we lucky we got them. That took place in Chicago, by the way, right? A lot of movies and television shows that presented the race problem in America as a prejudice problem. So we kept hearing that, you know, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. What we really need is not a love that's a sappy sentimentality, but a love that would require reorientation of life and an affirmation of the truth. So my last line, <laughs> we need a radical reorientation in Christianity. It's not about who we put into the White House. It's about who has control of our heart, our mind, and our soul. So may God bless us to respect the power of presumed powerless people. May God allow us all to experience the might from the margins. Because I believe if we do, we'll help make Christianity Jesus-like again. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Once again, just want to express my appreciation uh, to Dr. Edwards. Uh, I hope you have been as challenged by his talks as I have. Uh, and if you'd like an opportunity to express your appreciation or purchase a book, uh, he'll be up here uh, just for a few minutes. Uh, but as always, you know, don't hang around too long because of the COVID. So <laughs> thanks again for coming out this afternoon, and thanks to everyone who's watched Thank online. You. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>